taking a breath. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Joint Town Council and School Board Workshop for Wednesday, May 13th. And we'll go ahead and uh, have Tom and, sure. and George do introductions. Yeah, we uh, took the liberty of putting it, uh, an agenda together really just to make sure, as an agenda does, make sure the evening goes uh, as smoothly as possible. Uh, as I recall, this is the second year uh, both bodies have convened in a joint budget meeting. So this is still kind of an evolving process. I would note, uh, certainly members around this table that have been on their respective finance committees have met a lot this year, a lot more. Uh, there's been really unprecedented collaboration. Uh, but it certainly makes sense to broaden that conversation, include the four other folks on each of the bodies. And I think that's really what we intend to do tonight. So uh, following the agenda, I think George is going to start by just recounting a bit of what we've done this spring so you get us to this point uh, in this budget review process. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it starts back in uh, December. Uh, but there have been a total of uh, regular joint finance uh, committee meetings with the uh, town council and school board um, finance committees. Uh, there's been six of those. There's been a, a regularly scheduled budget review session uh, with, the, uh, with those uh, same uh, uh, finance committees. There's been um, sort of an unprecedented un, uh, uh, town and uh, school joint presentation of the uh, first uh, rollout of the budget, the, the first reading of the budget, and as well um, something that mm, might have happened a while ago, but certainly not during my time, and I don't think during Tom's time, uh, but there was a jointly sponsored um, and hosted town budget forum, which I think um, got some pretty good reviews. Um, the, uh, the work that's been done with the finance committees together have covered just a whole array of topics, including um, process improvements to the budget, um, establishing norms and guiding principles in terms of how we were going to operate together, and I think that worked out real well, um, to set a budget adoption process and schedule. Um, they, uh, we all spent some time talking about building technology capacity uh, K-12 in the schools, and specifically about that, that what people refer to as the high school laptop proposal. Um, we did a good bit of planning uh, jointly, uh, both at the meetings and behind the, those, uh, the scenes uh, of those meetings, planning for the budget forum, again, which I think uh, people would have rated as a pretty good success. Um, we shared with the group uh, how the school goes about developing a level services budget for schools, uh, we all took a look at cost drivers on both the, um, the town and school side, uh, clarifying uh, budget uh, forum objectives and, and uh, creating a format that would work. Uh, in, uh, we've talked a bit about engaging the public, and I think that that was our primary effort was around the, um, with the forum. Um, uh, providing some clarity on some misconceptions uh, uh, out there related to per pupil costs school spending, um, uh, comparisons and metrics for calibrating uh, school spending growth, and, uh, and a whole lot of other things. Uh, I think that, um, just, just checking my, uh, we talked uh, um, a, a good bit about uh, the proposed uh, education improvement plan, the investments uh, that make up the 335 roughly $335,000 that you find in the school budget. Um, we looked at staff uh, full-time equivalents and changes over the last few years and where uh, they've impacted each of the budget categories. Uh, we looked at the impact of charter schools uh, historically. It's been a positive change there in terms of, um, of uh, we were able to pull that out of the expenditure side just recently based on some work that was done up in Augusta. We looked at the history of fund balances, and, and likely there was a whole lot more. I think that um, we're also committed as a joint finance uh, committee to um, do a bit of a wrap-up, a reflection, and some planning for continuing our work. And a big part of that commitment in terms of continuing the work is to deep, uh, dig deeper into some of the analyses that we started um, and attempt to bring some predictability to the budgeting process. <coughs> A lot of, uh, a tremendous amount of work. Very impressive. So uh, the second agenda item, um, we've prompted three different areas that we thought might be helpful to at least start the conversation. Um, 
I should preface my comments by saying many of us around this table just an hour ago were in a finance committee meeting of the town council. They have worked through and are in a position of making recommendations, and uh, Councilor Bayline uh, will share those uh, later on the agenda. But uh, before we get there, it may make sense to update on these three different prompts mm -hmm. based on the school budget. Mm -hmm. um, not sure George or Cater will yeah. handle the expenditure part. Yeah, we, we'll cover expenditures. Um, and again, we'll do this very briefly and give you the latest, greatest update. Uh, also in terms of the laptop program and some, um, some uh, change in the uh, projected cost there. And I can address C uh, right off by saying we're s still hearing that there's a potential for some additional subsidy. Mm -hmm. We are not um, either holding our breath that that happens anytime really soon, and we are not uh, basically anticipating uh, a windfall. But I do think that that, that is still out there. Um, depending on the timing of that, it's, it's most likely not going to impact us this year. I think we, we're at where we are. But should there be a change and should there be some additional subsidy, um, that would come to the schools and would be um, uh, seen as um, uh, undesign, uh, undesignated surplus that would be carried over and would have an impact on the budget planning for the subsequent year. And we'll just keep uh, folks posted, but that's that's something that um, is still in play. Uh, Kate, you want to do the uh, expenditure update? Sure. <coughs> I, I wonder if, if everybody picked up one of these, because I do have some handouts here, and I'm going to pass them out to other folks. Um, and this two pieces are the three colors are the two that I have here. Is it the same as these? Back to the same as what we've got? I think everyone has one. I think the only people that don't is the audience. Really okay. No, it's the packet that's stable. So is this, is this what we've already the got? Materials yes. get circulated. Well, uh, oh, well, get the people to have. These spreadsheets that don't reflect uh, everything that the finance committee would be recommended. So I just wanted to clarify that at the outset. Yeah. So what you'll be looking at once you have this in your hand in one form or another is a document that says updated as of 5 7 2015 at the top in red. And so as Tom says, it doesn't take into account the work that was just done a few moments ago <coughs> by the um, town council finance committee. So what it does take into, into account is the changes that have happened uh, up until today in the school budget proposal. Um, so the proposal that was passed at first reading is this blue column. And it's parked next to the proposal or to the approved operating budget for fiscal 2015. So the blue column is essentially what happened at the first reading. And the green column to the right is uh, takes into account all the changes that have happened since then. So you can see uh, if you go straight to the bottom line, the total change in expenditures, which is about a third of the way up the, the page has gone from a 7.81% increase over fiscal 15 to a 4.51% increase. Uh, those changes have been uh, noted and reported and in, in essence adopted by the Town Council Finance Committee uh, as a recommendation for a reduction to the school budget coming from the Schools Finance Committee. Um, and these are uh, the kinds of changes that have taken place are to uh, most, in most cases to benefits. Um, where we've had um, more accurate information, we've been able to reduce our, our um, projections from the first reading to the point where we're still uh, providing for the same services with the same personnel, but it's going to cost us less to do so. Um, so that you'll see there's a big reduction. The biggest reduction is in that first line that salaries, wages, and benefits um, in the base expenditure change um, going from uh, over $2 million of increase from last year to, to this, uh, down to below $1 million. Um, other changes have come, uh, there's a little change in operations, which is to do with some favorable uh, impacts of 
property and casualty insurance. We had our insurance agents working feverishly to reduce our rates there and uh, were successful in, in some regards. So there's a small reduction there. You'll see the sort of pretty pink box that screams out at you. That's the latest reduction that we made, and that is what uh, George just referred to. The, the charter school tuition that was built into our budget, I think most of you have read or heard us talk about this. Um, charter school tuition up until now was expected to be paid by the school district in which the student resides. So any kid from Scarborough who chose to attend a charter school, um, we would be paying tuition for that child to attend. So it's part of our operating budget. It was one of our expenses and we're paying a quarterly bill. Um, the new legislation in Augusta, which was just signed this Monday by the governor, Mm -hmm. says that they are now going to fund those charter schools directly. So they're going to go into the Department of Education's disbursement of subsidy. Probably we'll lose a little subsidy over that because the pool of subsidy will shrink because now we're funding charter schools out of that as well as other public schools. But there's so much play going on, as George made reference to, in, in terms of how much money is actually going to be in that pool, uh, that we're not really counting on a significant impact um, from that. But what it does do for us is it says, you don't have to pay that bill, you don't need that money in your operating budget, so we can reduce our expenditure side um, accordingly. So that just comes right out. Uh, the other adjustment that's been made since first reading is a small adjustment in debt service. You'll see if you look across that line, which is about halfway down the page. So there's a small <coughs> increase in our debt service. Um, and this is based on the true and um, documented debt service bond issue from this year, which was a guess when we went to first reading and is now done. Um, and the, uh, the increase is about $5,700, but you'll see down in the revenue section, down at the very bottom, that there's a new line that says debt service premium. <coughs> and the way that the, debt, the bond issue was structured, we're actually going to be saving money uh, in the net, in the aggregate, over what we had originally budgeted. So, slight in increase in the debt service on the expenditure side and a larger increase in revenue to offset that. So the net impact on taxes is to, to drive that tax request down. Um, I think that's pretty much everything. I did change the, um, in the fund balance appropriation, I did change the way that that was designated and, and put it into two lines. You'll see a difference there. We originally said fund balance $450,000 in the, the second round. We're saying actually $200,000 of that is undesignated fund balance and $250,000 of that is allocating what we wanted funds. So we just want to be a little bit more specific about <coughs> where those monies are coming from. I think that's pretty much the high points. Do you have see here? So the, the second page is then just an, an even more simple first proposal, first reading, and status as of, let's say, this morning, because it doesn't take into account any actions at the finance committee. So the, just the bottom line changes, the, that totals $1,410,032 in positive change, reduction, if you will. In reduction, in, in reduction to our, our need for taxes to support the school budget. Um, no, so I wanted uh, Jen to walk us through. Um, there was also part of, a, of the packet that you received was a two-page um, updated uh, laptop proposal. Uh, this is the uh, building the capacity of the high school proposal. And um, again, just a, a, a quick walk through of that, Jen, so that we see the, the change. Yeah, so George is referring to this paper. Um, they sent us a copy of this paper that was sent to the Just Why don't you just give everyone a moment so everybody have it? Yeah. Yeah. We're in the packet with the signature. So a couple of 
um, changes that we made, we have ended up, as you can see, the revised estimate, which is at the top of page one. We've ended up at just under $750,000. That will fund the entire program in year one. You can see that we have projected it out over six years to give you an idea of what it looks like annualized over six years. Um, there's been a lot of talk, one of the things I really wanted to emphasize was there's been a lot of people saying, well, it's $1,000 per student. It's when you take it out over six years, and the reason why we did it over a six year cycle was so that you could actually see what the year over year cost is, and we would take you through an entire replenishment cycle. So by the time you get to the end of six years, we have then replaced all of the machines. And one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that it's really, at the end of the day, at the end of the six years, it is a total of $232 per device per year over six years. The reason being because you're paying for some upfront costs, such as software, um, some of the management console, the security um, on the devices. You're paying for that upfront, but that's actually going to roll forward device to device. So really that $748,000 is going to cover all of that initial upfront cost and then you're just going to have some replacement cycles thereafter. So you can kind of see what that looks like over the six years. Um, what we did was we, we looked at um, some different financial models in terms of what families would pay towards the program. And as you can see on page two, we went out uh, primarily through the MLTI website, and that's the Main Learning Technology Initiative website, and we took a look at different school districts around the state of Maine and what they charge families for, basically it's a maintenance program. Um, so you can kind of see, with the $60 that we're proposing, we pretty much sort of fall into um, the, the norm there. Um, Sanford, for example, is at the high end. They charge $100 per year, but then you keep the, um, the device at the end. Um, and then primarily what's covered under almost all of these maintenance programs is just the cost of repairs, you know, day-to-day um, -day kind of repairs and replacements of peripherals and, and whatnot. The $60 that each family would pay each year per device would cover maintenance program, maintenance costs, and would also cover the cost of the um, ADP. And again, ADP is the accidental damage protection on each device. Um, if you take a look at what we charge as a district, that's on page one towards the middle of the sheet there. Grades three through five, so it won't work. Families pay ten dollars per device um, per year, and that covers again the the maintenance cost. But really, those devices don't ever go home; they don't ever leave the premises. Um, grades six through eight pay twenty five dollars annually per device. Um, sixth grade, they have restrictions on taking them home. Seventh and eighth grade, they um, take them home, but they do have to leave them on site over holidays and some long weekends. Um, and that's, we do maintenance on the devices then. Grades 9 through 12, we're proposing $60. They will be taking these laptops home every day, all year, throughout the school year. Over the summer, we will take them back. We'll do all the maintenance, the cleaning, the imaging, all of that. At the end, you'll also notice that we have a bio program. So at the end of year one, for example, these devices are one year old the family would have paid $60, and they have an option as seniors to buy out at $400. The cost of that buyout is going to decrease every year by $100 until it hits that floor of $100, and then it will stay there. So seniors will always have the option at the end of their senior year to buy out $400. Um, we have reduced the overall number of devices, um, just down 50 units. That's going to be kind of tough on the IT department, but what we are proposing to do is become um, basically certified technicians. And so we'll try to take care of most of the maintenance and the small fixes and repairs in-house in my staff. I think that pretty much takes you through the changes that we've made. Yeah, I have a question. Um, on that $60 per year, uh, how much of that is maintenance and damage protection? And I know the intent of the council is to have some portion of the cost of the parents go back to a, a fund. Yeah. 
that would be used in future years to pay for the ongoing. So could you break that down, that $60? Yeah, the ADP piece of it is about $30 per year. Okay. So essentially, if you think about the way ADP is, if you go out and buy a car, right. and you buy an extended warranty on the car, that's going right. to be rolled into the cost of the device. That's how, when I go out and purchase devices, I don't ever purchase them now without ADP. Um, ADP, by the way, will take care of everything from cracked screens to liquid spills to you know, cracked hinges, um, you know, anything that's accidental and not intentional damage. So to about thirty dollars per year yeah. goes towards that. So that's really sort of goes towards the baseline cost of the device, and then we, we take another thirty and we put that into a segregated fund that's a maintenance fund, and that's rolled forward every year whatever's not used. Um, you know, we we base that amount on what we see used down at the middle school mm -hmm. in terms of you know damage and right. what needs to be repaired and replaced because it's not just the device we also have to replace things like the you know power cords right. and peripheral yeah. all the peripherals yeah. Yeah. so so the the fund therefore will be segregated <coughs> and used only for maintenance and then the not the for rest of it goes towards basically the <coughs> cost of the device but nothing then is left over for further purchase down the line well if you look at the way it's segregated out the $30 is is for maintenance, and then the other 30 is then kind of rolled forward into the cost of the future devices. Because okay. Because we have to replace the devices that we sell. <coughs> uh, is there some sort of program that's going to be in place for those families that can't afford this? Yes. So if you, I don't know, did you get the line item breakout? No, it's just the two pages. Chart. Okay. So in the line of breakout, what it shows is in the maintenance program, um, I only actually budgeted for 860 families to pay into it because mm -hmm. we, we factored in a 14% free and reduced rate. Okay. Thank you. And we do already have an opt-out um, system in place that works very well at the middle school and at the library school. So we're working on bringing that whole same concept up so we have the same supports in place. Don't everybody all speak up. <laughs> 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 if there are more than, well, if a family has more than one child in high school, is this still $60 per device? It will be. Good. One important point, I mean, we, the conversation really is, in many cases, is focused on the device and what it is, but um, I had a bit of a revelation, if you will, talking with George. It, it really amounts to a pretty significant educational improvement enhancement, um, and I don't profess to even come close to understanding what that's going to mean for curriculum and all those sorts of things. But. Um, that seemed to be a, a just a meaningful point I don't want to lose sight of. It's so easy to look at the numbers and talk about what the device is, but what it's going to enable is, is really an important feature, the most important feature. It's, it's, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that um, Tom had a revelation speaking with me. That was really, <laughs> that's really nice. Um, uh, it's a, it's a game changer. It's not just a different way to hand in papers. It's not just a different way to uh, communicate with teachers. It's a game changer in the way that we do education. And um, it can, you know, it will, it will lessen our, um, our dependence on, on uh, sort of physical uh, learning materials. And it will um, really open up classrooms uh, to not just be contained within the classroom right. of, of the high school, um, but it can be a classroom where there are kids from all over the world um, also collecting the same data that, that our students are collecting and, and they can be working collaboratively, um, which is just a, an amazing game changer for kids in terms of their perspective and, um, and the exposure that they get to so many uh, incredible uh, learning experiences that we cannot create in the high school without the technology. Um, has anyone quantified, I know I'm going to quantification, right. which isn't what I do, but 
because I get asked this all the time. Yeah. How is this going to impact purchase of textbooks in the future? Because I know textbooks cost a fortune. Yeah. And then also the use of paper yeah. and photocopying charges, which are huge. Yeah. I, I, don't have the, I don't have the quantitative uh, values for the paper. But I think you got it. It's it's huge. It, it's, so it's it, c it can be um, some some um, readily um, uh, uh, savings that are readily available to us. I think um, there's all sorts of analysis about what it does for text materials. Um, and I would basically just say um, it. What I've read is that it's about. 30%. It costs us 30% because you still have subscriptions oh, right. and right. all of those. And the you know, licenses and whatever, right. right. But it's, it's about 30% of what it would be had, had we um, uh, been uh, trying to do that with, with uh, textbooks. And mm -hmm. I don't see any of my colleagues over there kind of like giving me like a <laughs> uh, kind of look. So I, I'm going to go with that. <laughs> May I interject? We were at a meeting today, uh, Kelly and I and, and Judy. And I asked the question because there were people there uh, at the meeting who have one-to-one -one at their high schools. And again, they said they couldn't quantify that as far as the cost is concerned. But what they could tell us is that it doesn't cost more than purchasing textbooks. Right. What it does for the student is it keeps them current on what's happening today, number one. Number two, it keeps the faculty in closer contact with the student, <coughs> whether the student is in the classroom or not. And lastly, it helps the school keep in touch with the parent because the student can take the device home. Right. And I, we asked about, well, what about people who don't have Wi-Fi in their homes, and Jen has the answer to that because it's the same answer that she gave when I asked the question before. For anybody who doesn't have Wi-Fi in their homes, that was the reason why we chose the device that we did, and there has been a lot of questions about why didn't we go with Chromebooks, and we did look at Chromebooks very seriously, um, but Chromebooks are really just a portal to the internet, so you really do have to have Wi-Fi access to be able to work on a Chromebook. With the devices that we've chosen, you can actually you know, store that material. You'll have um, access to all of the applications and software that will be loaded directly to your machine. So you can actually do your work offline. And then when you get into Wi-Fi range, you can you know, upload your, your information. Um, just to further answer the question, though, about reduction in paper costs, there's a couple of different pieces to that that we've been working on over the past couple of years. One is we are, have moved to a centralized print solution called mm -hmm. PaperCut. So essentially, instead of um, trying to figure out, you know, if you have 15 printers, which one is named HS12596, right. on calls, you know, two, you can just send it to print, go to any printer, type in your code, and it pulls it right there. So we've already seen a reduction in cost of paper, right. cost of ink, cost of cartridges, drums, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that will be rolled out. We have some things in place already at the high school to do that. The second thing is we have moved the entire district to Google, uh, Google Drive. Um, as of February, everybody was live on Google Drive, and, and the G Drive was closed down. What that's done for us is it allows the students and the teachers to collaborate online. And so we see a lot less paper because you really don't need to print it out if right. everybody's just going into Google Drive, sharing out their documents, and working on it that way. So I, I think that you're going to see it's sort of a multi-factor you know, solution to reducing those overall costs. But the key there is that you can't get on Google Drive unless you have a device. So that's a big part of you know moving everybody in that direction. I'd also like to point out the fact that the state's moving to electronic testing as well, um, whether we want them to or not, and we have to administer that. And it's been very, very challenging this year at the high school to administer those electronic tests, scheduling it in the computer labs that we have. So that's also a very large disruption in time and scheduling in other kids' classes. Um, that we're hoping to avoid. You're talking to an opt-outer here. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not suggesting one way or the other. I'm just saying the facts as they are. And I don't think he was
criticizing the test. I was simply not. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm being a wise guy. Not you. Not me. <laughs> And just two, two additional points that, that I'd like to make is, is the concept of students working on a group document, one document, several kids working on it anytime, anywhere, to bring that document together, I think is just that fabulous, a fabulous thing. You don't have to meet at the library or McDonald's or anything. You, you're, you're already on it, all working on that one document. Um, and also, I, and um, Monique can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we already do have some tech materials that we, we have purchased. They came along with other things that we purchased, and so they're not being used. They're just sitting there. They yeah. would be of real value to the teachers and to the, to the students. So, so it could maximize the utilization of investments that we've already made. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And when you figure it's... If, if you were going to buy, you know, go out and buy, uh, say, a new history book and you were going to supply, I mean, you've got probably a couple of courses at the high school, required courses for history, definitely one full year. You know, and now you've got access to several texts to provide you the history information. So it's really the depth and the quality of the information that you now have quick access to that changes everything about what you have just learned and understand on that topic. So I have a question. Um, so we're talking about the, the moral and some of this in the principle is about being able to have maybe cost savings or cost realizations from things that aren't being utilized. Mm -hmm. My question is, um, so where does that lie in, in your budget proposal, you know, just for future reference? You know, are we talking, is this the instructional materials and resources. Mm -hmm. um, is there, that leads me to another question, so w what is it? <laughs> are, are these textbooks, are these software, or is this, I'll, you I'll know? I'll let Kate tell you what's in the, the, the line. Instructional materials, um, it's really all of those things. It's, it's anything that, that touches the classroom, and it depends on the phase that you're in. It could be, you know, at the kindergarten level, it could be the kind of consumable workbook sheets that they use on paper. At the high school, it could be a software that the teacher is already using with the projector in the classroom. Um, so instructional supplies are basically the, the line items in our budget that we've pulled together to say that these are the materials that we're using in the classroom. Um, it does include textbooks. Um, so uh, am I answering the question? It's yeah, I just, yeah, there. if there's a cost savings where we might find it in the future is helpful to know. Yeah, and um, if we continue to sort of clump our budget in the same areas, which I think is helpful, then presumably we'd be able to see any shifts that happen in there in that area. And it might, uh, what we're seeing in, in the other phases is shifts from print, where there's a textbook line, to uh, contracted services line, which might be that software license. It, is there anything that's, maybe I'm asking the stupid question here, but uh, no question. Are, are we not, I mean, I know, did you figure in, is there any new textbooks or, or something that, that maybe could be put off for a year? Is there is there something in this proposal that, you know, with incoming technology might not be worth investing in? Um, I think that, um, again, I think Kate, can, Kate knows what's in these lines much better than I, but I, I think that um, we have not done a specific offset in one place. I think that we've actually been quite conservative in that area uh, because we'd rather, we'd rather be investing in the staff that we have in, in the classroom rather than the materials. And I think that was evident by um, Jody Shea bringing a, a few of the textbooks um, that we're still using one of them that's older than most of our high school kids. So we've been really very conservative in that area to begin with. Um, your th thoughts, Kate? Um, I guess <coughs> I could say that we have deliberately not gone out and costed out replacement textbooks in some of those cases where ordinarily we'd be in a cycle where we'd say, hey, it's time to refresh that textbook that Joni brought that you know is older than my child. Um, on the other hand, if we think that we're going to be moving towards a new technology and a new curriculum, it's silly to go out and, and make those purchases. So I could say that we have not requested anything in our operating budget for the high school 
for replacement textbooks, and if we do not have the technology, then that's something that we'll have to be looking at in the future. But it, I think if you look at the individual line items, you'll probably see incremental increases in our contracted services lines and either sort of flat or reduced in uh, the textbook lines because there are individual line items in the detail budget. Could you explain why then the instructional materials and resources line has gone up forty-eight thousand dollars this year? If we're going to one-on-one, -on -one? because we have a really big district and a lot of needs, we've got new curriculum uh, that's coming through with the K-2s. Um, we've got a writing curriculum out there. We've got some things going on in some of the other phases, and we also have cost increases. So even simple things like paper and pencils and. Uh, workbooks and the things that we're already providing will increase in price as well. So it, I, I don't think you'll see, oh gosh, we're going to save all this money with the new laptops. I think you'll see we're going to redirect that and we may see some reductions going forward. Didn't, which didn't quite get to my next question, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, well when, when you put a technology online through the middle school and down, you know, at the younger school, I mean, where there's some noticeable realized savings again you know we're talking about some of these you know your shared platforms less paper less books I mean are, are these being realized I mean you've had some experience with that so I'd say we've definitely seen savings in paper at the lower phases I mean Wentworth is brand new with their technology and, and at that age level it's a much more paper and pencil mm -hmm. crowd developmentally um, at the middle school, we definitely have, particularly with the paper cut system going in, where they have print to the local, local printer, um, significant reductions in the need for use of paper. So I would say, you know, the MLTI group is right on board with it. They've been at it for 12 years, and and that's definitely a savings. I think this is uh, since this is a workshop, and we're we're just kind of throwing stuff around. I, I mean, I think the bottom line when we were looking at this is, this is not cutting edge technology. We're not we're not ahead of the curve or, you know, out in advance of anybody. <coughs> we are literally some of the last adopters in the region and in the state to do this. So part of it, well the money is a concern and I think we've done just about everything we can to squeeze as much as we can out of it. There is going to be a a fundamental shift that we can't put a dollar value with. And that happens with any technology shift when you go from the horse and buggy to the car, when you go from you know, uh, any, you know, the abacus to the, to the stencil and the paper. It's going to be a shift, and we know that. And I think we've, we've really focused on reducing that number to as much as possible, but the goal of this isn't, a, isn't purely financial. It's not just a, we're doing this because we want to reduce costs in textbooks. There are advantages that, you, that right now we can't quantify, but we know other districts are realizing, both in performance and efficiencies and program improvements. So, so I, 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 I definitely, from the finance side, get the numbers and we crunch those and we look at those. But to, but to try and do a, we're going to save, you know, twenty percent in textbooks and twenty percent, we're going to offset those costs. I think we'll, we'll, we'll flush those out. But I, I, I wouldn't want that to be the sole basis for making that uh, decision. I, I think my, my point is, I'm trying to. Some, some of the questions that I hear from, from constituency is cost benefit. So, you know, that, that's kind of where I'm about, you know, right, well, you've had this. It, it, you've had it in place in the middle school. You, you're aware of other districts that have it. So, so where's your cost? I mean, are we experiencing guess, offerings that we wouldn't normally at the middle school? Because now you have your online, to, I mean, maybe are you doing something with the foreign language because you have online capability I mean, so that you wouldn't normally have? Yeah. What's the, yeah, the cost I benefit? I the middle school was when the shift is that you start, teachers with their curriculum start looking at software. What are some of the other softwares that I can purchase to enhance my curriculum that I'm using? So some of the shift out of textbooks, you might not use all the textbooks, or you might go to a paperback of a version of something, but now you're looking at other softwares, like is it a newspaper subscription? Is it um, an online tutorial that I can purchase to help my kids while they're in the classroom with me? So those are the things that when you have one-to-one -one, that you start, look, you start looking at for to enhance the classroom, which when you didn't have one-to-one, -one, you weren't going down that road. I think, I, you know, I, I, I get what you're saying, and return on investment makes sense to me. <coughs> Um, and I think that there is return that is, is measurable, and I think as Chris says, we'll, we'll see that more and more. 
Um, I, I think uh, one example, you know, I think about this as, you know, less than a million dollar output. And one of the things that I looked at um, in another district was bringing foreign language um, to the elementary school, to, to starting in first grade. And um, when we priced that out in a, in a smaller district than this, the cost for a more traditional program of foreign language um, for elementary school would have been about a million dollars. It would have been an, an, an additional million dollar uh, cost. And the way that I look at it, although I'm not saying that we're going to have um, foreign language in grades one, two, and three, um, like next year, but the potential is then created, and I'm just using that as an example, the potential that technology <coughs> creates is to make the investment in technology, have it impact learning across the content areas, <coughs> and, and that one example of what it would have cost it to um, afford students an opportunity for a longer sequence of foreign language, which is what they need in order to be fluent, um, is created. So right there, there's almost a a one-to-one, dollar-to-dollar -one, um, uh, <coughs> uh, return on the investment uh, if, you're, if you're able to do that. If you think of what we might be able to do at the high school, which um, uh, is, you know, we just, I just looked uh, again today, people noticed that the U.S. news came out and the rankings and all of this other stuff, and we were number 10 in the high school last year. And now we're number 11. And I went back again, and I looked, and I thought, um, so let's take a look at how we compare just with teacher to student ratio. And I did the analysis that I did last year. And I just took the average of those top 10 districts in Maine. This time, uh, Academy of uh, <coughs> Math and Science is not in there. So these were all regular high schools. And I looked at their average, um, and I calculated it. And then I looked at our average, and we're basically 1 to 14. And if we were just at the average of the, those top 10 um, in terms of teacher to student ratio, we would have between 17 and 19 more full-time equivalent teachers at our high school. So um, are we going to have 17 to 19 more uh, teachers? No. Have we asked for them? Absolutely not. But technology is, again, not just, so it's not just cost savings, it's cost avoidance. And that's what technology can do at the high school, is create those opportunities for our kids to, to, to pursue a deeper level of engineering and foreign language and some of the, some of the uh, sciences and, and more advanced math and allow us to avoid the cost of actually creating those um, in a more traditional way with, with the teachers. We have seen that at the middle school. Um, we have a couple of middle school kids actually who are really into coding, computer mm. coding. And we don't offer that mm. as a language at the middle school. But because there are a number <coughs> of free online courses and they all have laptops, we've been able to get them online. And we've had a couple that have actually gained certificates from <laughs> really complex, <laughs> like things that I would never even attempt, Python and some other yeah. languages. So, you know, heading into high school, they're that much further ahead, and heading out of high school, you know, they could probably write their own ticket to college. And but I think that's something that we couldn't, we would not be able to offer them if they didn't have technology. If that's important on the high end. I think it's equally important on the lower end of the students as well. If you've got a student who's falling behind or underachieving, it allows the teacher to kind of individualize that the, the lesson with that student and work on them independently without slowing the rest of the class down. I mean, I think if you, you saw that also with the middle school where you've got, you've got kids at different levels for whatever level they happen to be at, um, the traditional classroom where the teacher would have to, you know, does everybody understand? Who doesn't understand? You know, the old lecture type of style. That kind of can slow almost everybody down. I think with the flexibility and the efficiency that you gain from the one-to-one -one computing even at the high school level, you're going to be able to allow kids to advance, I don't want to say at their own pace, because they're still going to have requirements to meet, but if, if someone needs a little extra work and a little bit more attention, the, the teacher can give that to that individual, whether it's through an electronic lesson plan, or <coughs> checking up on them, or collaborating on the laptop, versus doing that in an entire classroom setting. So I think, I think it definitely benefits the higher-end students, but there's also a benefit, I think, on the, on the, on the, the struggling students as well. Well, that's what I was going to say. I think the bottom line is that technology levels the playing field, not only within our high school, 
But we are never going, not never, hopefully, but in our near future, not going to have the budget of Yarmouth, of Falmouth, per student, per classroom, per anything. But if our students don't even have the basic level of technology, there's no way they're ever going to be able to compete with those students in those schools. This way, if a kid is excelling, they can take classes beyond what we're offering in high school. If they need help, they can take classes that will help them remediate that. You know, there's the possibilities are literally endless, and this one piece of equipment levels the playing field for our high school students to compete, not just in Maine, but across the country. It's, it's that fundamental and that huge a shift in the way teaching and learning will happen just with this investment. I mean, you've heard the textbooks are old. We're not investing in the old technology because we didn't have the money, but because it's old technology. And the hope has been that we can get caught up. So we have been very careful to not invest in old technology that is not going to be improving our high school, improving the education of our students. So I think it's overall been a very thoughtful process. We've taken the time, we've done the research. Everyone around us has it. That's not a reason to do it. But it's a reason to do it because everybody else has it. I mean, honestly, it's not, it's not um, experimental therapy anymore. I mean, this is real. This is how kids learn. And it's, it's, it's absolutely within our means to provide it. So. Well, I, oh, can I just say one quick thing? Yeah. Um, I, for me, I feel like all students should be have access to the same thing. So just because three kids in one class might, may financially be able to afford a home computer, it doesn't mean that six other kids can't. And I think that they have that right to be able to have that same education that the other three kids can have because their parents can afford those laptops. We have a lot of people, I think people forget um, that we have a lot of kids in this town that their parents can't afford laptops or home computers. Um, and so for me, that's, um, that's a big draw. I don't know who was first, sorry, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> you can dig it out. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to go side bit? Uh, I have a daughter who went off to college this year, and she graduated from Scarborough, and she's down at the University of Central Florida in Orlando, and it's amazing to see that everything she does turns in, takes a oh, test, yeah. whatever it might be, is online, is I'm sending my paper electronically right. to that teacher, that teacher's annotating it, saying, hey, your first rough draft is this X, Y, Z, fix this, this, and this, and she fixes it and sends it back. It's really just that important to have that and it's just uh, I just can't even say how many things have been of a benefit in in her having had it at the middle school knowing how it is she came to the high school didn't have it so kind of reverted back to I'll call them old ways not that they're necessarily old but certainly different and now having then left again for college and been like oh, they want me to do what? And, oh, now I can get my textbook online. Right. So, I mean, you have those options still. You can, if you want that hardcover book and you want to go down to the Barnes & Noble bookstore on campus and buy that hardcover book for $58, or I can oh, pay $12.95 and I can get that textbook online mm -hmm. and, you know, obviously then overall reducing the cost of it. <coughs> You know, I think most people recognize the importance of the technology, that it's beyond the time when we should have had it. But I think given the difficulties that uh, the community has with uh, increased taxes in recent years, and we've had some steady increases, uh, I think it's important for them to understand the efficiencies that have been mm -hmm. built into this process. And I know Jen has worked, has sharpened her pencil, this program is down $120,000 in its first year from what it was originally proposed. Uh, some of that is going to be uh, through uh, training that your staff is going to take on. Uh, could you also explain how we're not going to be throwing away computers that are becoming you know, obsolete after four or five years? What's going to happen to those when they're not purchased by, by high school seniors? 
Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I have heard a couple of times now um, different folks have brought up that after three years it's going to be an obsolete machine and why are we investing this money. Um, the average lifespan that I intend, I hope, to get out of these machines will be between four and five years minimum. <coughs> Once we wring every ounce of life out of them at the high school, if it's still actually usable, we will roll them down to, say, a K2 level because they are tablets. So K2 hands could definitely you know, work with them, and those could just be you know, extra devices that they have in addition to whatever else they have. Um, but I, these are not going to be obsolete. Part of the reason why we chose the device that we did was because it's scalable. So that you know, if we do move to a Windows 10 or a Windows 8, um, and those are touchscreen operating systems, you know, that we would be able to move into that without having to say, oh, now we all need all new devices. So we bought them with the intent, with enough memory, with enough processing power, with the touchscreen, so that they would be scalable for at least four to five years. Anything that is not sold will be rolled down and or once it's, it actually has lived its good life and expires, um, we will recycle them. So we'll pull the, the hard drives and we'll recycle the chassis. Affordability has been a, a big part of this and uh, I was a strong supporter of the proposal that we uh, asked the parents to pay uh, uh, not the $25 that was originally proposed in this proposal just a few weeks ago, but $100. And then the school board came up with a proposal for per selling the computers out uh, combined with a $60 payment and uh, looking at the list, I became convinced mm -hmm. that I was probably too aggressive in expecting parents to pay $100. That I think 60 was a better number mm -hmm than I had sort of settled upon in my own mind. And so I, I very much support the proposal that has been arrived at. I think people have to keep in mind too that the devices are not consumer devices. The devices that we're purchasing, you won't find at Best Buy. They are commercial grade devices. They are semi-ruggedized by DMD standards. I told the finance committee last week that I was with the Lenovo rep and I actually flipped it into a tablet and said, what happens if this drops on the ground? So it would be fine. So I slammed it glass down on the ground with the Gorilla Glass and it was fine. Absolutely fine. And then I took it <laughs> and I slammed it onto the ground. We didn't buy that one, by the way. Unfortunately, it was the guy's first one. <laughs> So I, I have total confidence that we're going to get a good number of years out of these devices. This is why the vendors really like Jen. <laughs> <laughs> we go through vendors a lot. Yes, a lot, oddly. Many of you know that I've been on the board off and on for a long time. And, and I can recall when we were questioned about providing a calculator for each student. And I'm serious. I'm very serious. At a time when Texas Instruments were charging about $150 for calculators. Same one you can buy today, what, $18 or $15. Same thing transpired when there was a new process for a microscope. What was that called, Joanne? Uh, they, they could put the microscope down and it could flash up on the on the screen. We wanted to buy two of them and they were like four or five hundred dollars. But we could only, you know, we put two in the budget. Oh, people went ballistic. What do you need that for? <laughs> well, you couldn't have one for every student because they were terribly expensive. But for the teacher to be able to use that as a teaching tool and then allow the students. So, you know, we just catching up with the most recent technology, and people are questioning the need. Our students deserve the opportunity to be the best that they can be. And I think this is the only way we can make that progress in our high school. Well, and please understand, too, that it's our job to question 
Absolutely. Than I mean, we have to also answer to our constituents. And Absolutely. I mean, your job is 100% to fight for the students, and I completely respect that. And as I've said a thousand times, I'm sure people are tired of hearing me say it, but our job is for the entire town. So we have to ask these questions. Absolutely. It's, it's absolutely not, in my opinion, it's not um, a negative thing. It's a good thing for us. The more information we can get out to the public, the more support we're all going to get for these things. And I think that's a, that's a powerful thing. If you want to really see the success of implementing technology, look at Wentworth. Going from a, a, an old school that didn't have hardly any technology to first year up and running with the technology that's been invested there. Ask any teacher there, ask any administrator there, what impact does that have on your classroom from last year at the old Wentworth mm -hmm. to this year at the new Wentworth? And you can get a grasp on the types of exponential changes we're talking about. It's very difficult for us to sit around a table and, and kind of get an understanding for the type of impact. So we look at spreadsheets, we look at numbers and, and that kind of stuff. Talk to, a, talk to a teacher, talk to an administrator. I, I, I guarantee you the responses you're going to get are going to be, it's changed, it's fundamentally changed the way we've delivered education at the, at the Wentworth School. And that's exactly what we're talking about for the high schools. Yeah, um, I just wanted to mention first off, um, I know Ms. Perry will remember this, I believe this is definitely not the first time that we've talked about one-on-one -on -one technology at the high school. I think it was seven years ago when it was first brought up and it was sidelined because of challenges then just like we were facing today. Um, the second is that I, I really think that we need to look at it from a perspective of a long-term investment in the schools because even though we have it in this year's budget and it's being financed through some type of long-term debt, you know, long-term being maybe three-year type of thing, um, it's really an impact to the next three years, at least just for this one year, of about $200,000 or $250,000. Okay. So it's not just about this year's application because you're not seeing the net effect and the taxes until next year when it's fully funded. So keep that, and, and we did have a, we were presented with a schedule, I think it was a six-year or seven-year schedule of... Um, oh, it's on the sheet. Yeah. And it actually laid out year by year what the right. net investment would be. There were a couple of years where um, it was very small, if not a reduction. And then there's you know the replacement year, I think it's 450000 So you really have to look at the long term because this isn't something that we're going to be able to walk away from next year if we're faced with even greater challenges at the town level from other state cuts, you know, whether it's uh, you know revenue sharing or county taxes or whatever it might be. So you really have to look at the long term part of this. But I guess my challenge with that thinking about how you're how you're classifying the one-to-one -one program, we wouldn't walk away from math textbooks next year. We wouldn't walk away from social studies textbooks. I mean, we've done that for years to students' detriment. At some point, we need to invest, and we need to just get on the train and say, this is worth it, instead of nitpicking and saying, well, yeah, but this and that and this and that, and we have to look at the whole town. I understand that, and I, I'm glad we've had so many conversations about this, so it's being vetted above and beyond anything I can imagine that in my four years, way beyond anything else, including almost the Wentworth School Project, which was a huge investment, and I'm not saying that wasn't fully vetted, because it was, but this is so fundamental to every student in the high school and to students to come for generate, I mean, not gen well, the students that are right now having technology from third to eighth grade, it's absurd that they would get there in ninth grade and not have it. I just don't understand the, the level of scrutiny from the council, knowing that our budget goes to a full town referendum. It seems um, that's, that's the part I have trouble with, because it's not new. It's not new technology. It's not new that the school board has talked about it, and we put it off and put it off and put it off. And I just feel like I don't know what else we can do, really. I feel like we're answering all the questions, and it's not, um, I, I, I'm looking for a new question, I guess, to see like what is really the issue. To, does, on that note, does anybody have any other questions about laptops and the proposal as um, 
as a finance matter, or you know, we're supposed to kind of talk about goods, bads, but I, I just wanted to, to be back on, on Sean just a little bit, and then I'll let it go. Um, we have a CIP budget every year that we do tech refreshes in, so I don't want everybody to think that this is going to be new money. We put them in a rotation to try and keep it predictable and keep it, uh, you know, reasonable and manageable. This would just add another year to the cycle, so it's not like we're going to be increasing our CIP by uh, 300,000 or 400,000 every year. We've rotated our, 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 our facilities through for a reason to keep it manageable, to keep it within the constraints of, of our, our parameters of cost control. So we would, in essence, be just adding another year to the cycle. So instead of going K2, Wentworth, Middle, back around again, and we do some at the high school, we would just be adding that high school to the mix, and that, and that portion would, would, would change a little bit for the high school side of things. So I don't want, I don't want to give the impression that we're that there's going to be a, a, a huge increase every year. Our tech refresh is, is in a normal rotation, much like our transportation and, and our other major capital budgets. So it, it can be planned and, and adjusted for and, 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 and predicted out for a long period. And the cyclical, cyclical refresh that you see here is planned exactly for that. On the larger sheet, I don't know if anybody Council got that, but in the larger sheet, it actually shows the years, mm -hmm. what refresh is which year. So the largest chunk of the refresh falls in the high school year. So it, the high school year would cover some of the, would cover this and then whatever else that would need. So we did plan that to actually go with the refresh years. So just to clarify, um, uh, Kelly, I think we're both saying the same things. We're saying it differently, and um, you use your hands more than I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, what I want to suggest, though, is that because one of the things that we do here is that when the state comes in <coughs> and reduces funding, we can't rely as part of our argument of why we increase taxes or why we increase our spending um, is because the state did that. And I'm suggesting is that if we're going to make a decision to invest, which I agree with, that we need to recognize that it's a long-term investment. It's not a one-year investment. And I do recognize that it's balanced out over several years. So we're di I think we're on the same page. We just said it a little bit right. differently. So, Well, the good news is, is if that moves forward, Scarborough is absolutely leading the pack, because that was one of my questions. How, how many other districts offer at what grade levels? And so we would be light hairs ahead of every other district. <laughs> No, so no, no, no. We're, we're at the end. We're at the end. Yeah. Um, I'm, well, that's for the lower levels. Slightly maybe yeah. different than at the high school level. At, at the high, if it went through at the high school, um, most we're at, we're at the end. We're at the end. Yeah. No, 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 no. I was saying as an overall that, that we'd have from grade Whoa. X to oh, you're grade saying from X. the lower level, so, so we yeah. I ahead of others. Now, uh, so, so we're okay. Auburn um, started two. So I'm not sure. Um, I asked staff for that, so I'm not sure where what happened there. So um, interesting, but so if we have no other questions, um, I, I do just want to say it's eight o'clock. Yeah. So um, what's um, number C? Potential change to state subsidy. I think I addressed that. Yeah. We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know yet. That's right. Yeah. So, well, Jim, maybe you could talk to us a little bit where you're um, pretty. Yeah, pretty with the main that. municipal. Um, as you know, there are two dueling budget plans going on up there: the governor's and then the Democratic plan. Um, it's my understanding from talking to members of Appropriations Committee and Taxation Committee that I know, obviously, neither of them is going to pass. What they're going to do is take pieces from each. Um, keep your fingers crossed. They are going to increase state subsidies for schools. That's one of the things that seems to have some legs, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything more, okay? No, but the number is yeah. twenty-five to 50000 uh, million. 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 Excuse me. I mean, it's not huge. No. But I'll take anything. I heard, I heard worst case scenario, we get nothing. Best case scenario, we get. Right. I think it will. That's what I heard. Yeah, I mean, it depends. But anyway. Yeah, so what I, just to add to that, is what I heard about the 25 or whatever the number is, is base league will cover the charter, the issue around the charter. Well, that's. So this will have a net zero impact to the town, hopefully. 
which is what we're kind of looking for. Right. Well, well, since the timing is such that we're likely, you're likely to adopt a budget before the state budget is oh, adopted, yeah. before we know that answer, yeah. the, the practical effect of that is it won't have any effect in right. fiscal year 16. To the extent we receive more general purpose aid to education, it will be realized as excess revenue and ultimately become fund balance at the end of next fiscal right. year, right? So maybe the best way to consider it is there was some conversation that there will be proposed use of fund balance and some concern about how low that's getting. To the extent that we do get more in GPA, uh, that may help take a bit of the edge off use of fund balance. Yeah, and, and I would remind people out there in the world, the Scarborough world, ta uh, taxpayers, parents, whomever, that um, you need to get on your legislators, all of them, to say, hey, come on, help us out here. Um, and we do, uh, uh, Representative Soraki is on the Appropriations Committee. So she's definitely one person, I think, who should hear from people if you feel strongly about uh, supporting schools. So, so Sean, that leads us into <clears throat> the next one. We haven't done anything at one yet. So for the purposes of the workshop, I'm only um, so uh, Ruth handed out um, um, what has been labeled. It's a separate handout. Um, I'll reference you with the green box on the bottom. Yeah, just check the date, the upper right hand. Yeah, five. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see that. Sorry. And the time. Five thirteen. And the time. Yeah. And the time. So um, also in the green box, if that's too small, the green box also tells you that it's as of today. So um, if it's okay with you, because uh, you can read the details, I'm going to just for uh, uh, public notification is really uh, delve into the bigger number. So the finance committee will be recommending to the full town council um, a total um, a total budget, which is the combination of both the municipal and the schools, of fifty nine million two hundred ninety five thousand one hundred sixty eight dollars. That is, um, on the tax rate, that is a 5.69% increase in the tax rate. The subset of that, and I'm not going to go into the towns because uh, the council will consider that, but you can see what that portion is. Um, really on page three is uh, what the, for the purposes of this conversation, um, what the schools is. And so the school, after our adjustments, is $39,130,225. Uh, their individual contribution to the total tax rate is 7.76% increase. Um, I want to point out that the recommendations that the superintendent and the school board presented to us um, it was uh, approved and adopted and accepted on, on, on their behalf, so I appreciate that effort. And there were some additional changes that the Finance Committee made and at the high level um, and others can talk to what they were, but I want to give you uh, at least that understanding. First was that there was a reduction in the educational gross of $90,100, and I'm rounding, if you don't mind. There was also a increase in educational revenues of 225000 and I will detail what that is, this is important. And then there was also a decrease in the capital improvement budgets of 75000 the most significant item that was adjusted was really the $225,000 in the revenues, and it will be an individual, probably an individual item that will need to be discussed at the full council. So the town council's finance committee reviewed its fund balance policy, which says that we really should keep one twelfth of um, accounts payable, or I'm sorry, of uh, operating budget, or 8.333%. Uh, we're currently, based on 2014's audited financials, we're currently at about 8.67. And so what we said was that the gap or the difference between that, or the variance of about $225,000 um, should be spent. And we decided uh, the intent was to actually allocate that to the school's budget. Um, technically speaking, it doesn't matter really where you have it, um, but the intent was that we wanted to support the uh, school's budget because of the impact that the state funding formulas and everything else that it's had um, is uh, reflected in that. Um, and so uh, with that, uh, I don't know if the other members of the finance committee want to add anything, or but that's kind of like the high level. Yeah, I would. I would just add that you know people can get confused by all the numbers that mm. go bandied about. Uh, uh, both town and school are increasing their spending as a result of all the circumstances they face, and in the school's case, I've come to understand they're plenty of difficult circumstances that are mandated upon them by just about 4% each. 
So each budget is going up about 4%. The impact on taxes on the school side is larger because they lost a million dollars. Uh, and so, uh, and I've never thought it fair to attribute that to just schools because it happened because we are a town. Uh, and, and we have good value in our town. Right. That's why the, the number of students that were uh, reduced in uh, our enrollment was relatively small. So uh, I think that's the way I look at it, that these are very much within the margin of expectation. Uh, if you look hard at why the costs are what they are, you come to say they're, they're mandated by the state they are uh, uh, the nature of the pupils who enroll in our schools uh, with the special ed expenses that have gone up uh, and uh, the contracts that for uh, increases and in health insurance uh, that we're obligated to pay. Uh, they're, they're negotiated hard, they're fair, uh, and I think that the numbers when looked at are very realistic. Uh, I would like to think that this is a blip on the screen from an impact point of view on the taxpayers because of the school funding formula. And I hope someday we get to the point where we're not dependent upon the state for any of that money uh, because it creates a great deal of unpredictability that uh, we'd like to all eliminate from our lives so that we had more control over our, our budget and our, our tax agent. All right. Did you? I, you're on finance too, Peter. Did I'm, you I'm want? Fine. I'll just save some of the comments later. Oh, you did. Um, boy, but I've been saying that for years. I'm going to take their money and bomb it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so on to item number four: discussion and questions. Is there any discussion or questions outside of what we've already talked about? Mm -mm. I just want to say a quick word. Um, I I agree with Bill with a lot of the things that he said, and, and I feel like it's become, supporting the school budget has become sort of a dirty word in town. And, and I think it's okay to stand up and say, you know what, we're a town who wants to invest in education. And be proud of that and, and own what you feel. So I, I hate the skirting around issues and sort of secretive discussions and all of that, like it's it's okay, and I think that as a town, we're we're having a, an identity crisis, and I feel like we need to decide as the leaders in this town what direction we want to go. And and I appreciate Bill's comments on it's it's okay to invest in schools and, and be proud of that. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> fight <Yeah. laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the challenge, and I think you know, we talked a little bit about before. I mean, you're right. This has become a really, really divisive issue in our community, and it really is a challenge because you have a part of the community. I mean, I, I haven't heard anybody say that they don't want to invest in education, but there are some real realities that we do have people in this community that are on fixed incomes, that their incomes aren't going up anywhere near the five or six percent, and they have some very real concerns about can they continue to afford to live in this town. So I think, I, I think people want to support education, but I think you know we are not making decisions for them. I think we need we work for our constituents in our town. I think we need to listen to what they're telling us. So I think we can't tell them what to do. I think it's our job to make sure that we communicate to them what the choices are and why they're there. But I think you can't dismiss if people are, are saying, geez, I just can't afford it. I think we have to at least acknowledge that. So, so right. it, we're I, not making decisions for them. We need to give them information so they can participate, so they can make the decisions about their community that they live in. We don't make them for them. So I think it's a, real, it's a real juggling right. act. So. I agree with that. But I also don't agree, the part I don't agree with is, and I think and you and I have had this discussion, Why not? Why not? Um, about instead of instead of reducing taxes on the backs of the schools let's lead let's create a program let's find a way to help those individuals i have family that has lived here forever so let's find a way to help those people this is this is an opportunity i, I really feel instead of getting into the weeds of 
the, nu the nuts and bolts of numbers and spreadsheets. We have an opportunity. Let's lead. Let's create something that helps those folks. Because you're also hearing from the other side. Absolutely. And There's these it's, emails that just keep coming in. It's very so divided. So we need to figure out. Right. But, but the problem is there's there's not going to be a safety net program that we can, I mean, it, the realities of where we are, these are the numbers that our community is going to see because we're not going to be able to have a safety net program you're describing. It's a great idea. But we're, oh, but actually, we, we do. It's, <laughs> have, <laughs> oh, it's, 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 it's not much because, unfortunately, the state, state limits, it. limits yeah. it and ties our hands with it, but we do have a senior we tax mean. relief program. Um, you know, we do try to advertise that every year, and uh, it's a lot less than it used to be um, from the state's reimbursement side, and unfortunately, I think our side too, the way it worked out. Um, you know, um, and I, I think that kind of goes to, to Peter's point. Even when we were helping, now we unfortunately have to help less because we get told to help them less. It's it's an odd oh, relationship. <laughs> it's not true. So, um, I, I was. It was a long winter, so I had time to look at the issue. I was mm. telling Jody this the other day, that, that the, all the literature speaks to the best way to address this problem is on a state-by-state, -state, statewide basis, and it's called the Earned Income Tax right. Credit. And that, that is the means by which people who are low income, uh, of, of, but residents have their houses, uh, are able to get a tax benefit, and that's a much more efficient way to do it than through the programs that we might try and do on a town by town basis. So there are so speaking with our legislators about this to make it a statewide solution rather than a Scarborough solution is really the best way to go. So. Um, to Jody's point, I want to mention is that so, um, so the superintendent mentioned in the beginning that really the next step for the joint committee is to talk about um, we're calling it lessons learned. You know, what did we experience? How can we improve that? Hmm. And then what can we change? And one of those changes that I'm hoping that we have is is to begin that conversation about the value investment that we need in the community, not only for the schools but also for the town. Hmm. And then how do we then plan that? And whether it's really appropriate for the finance committee to start that conversation um, or for the, all of our boards together, um, we, we will explore that. The challenge that I have is not knowing what on earth Augusta is going to do because for the next three years we are not going to know what is going to happen and it's going to be extremely difficult to have that value conversation, not knowing where our revenues are going to be, even though state income tax is increasing as far as their um, the collections. Um, uh, sales tax is increasing. Everything is showing positive in the whole state, but yet funding is being reduced at the local level. So we're going to get there, I promise, because uh, we talked about this at our committee, and, and we'll have something, because this was really the foundation year in getting that started. So I want to thank Chris for doing that. He's been, yep. from the time he entered the board till today, he has been pushing for joint efforts with the two boards to work together for the benefit of this town. I hate to give you a compliment. I know. it. You've got so many people, too. I'm shocked. I lost my train of thought. Um, that's good. Um, so I, being directly involved in the process, um, I, I do, again, want to reiterate, I, I do appreciate all three of Councilor Hayes, Councilor Donovan, Councilor Baybine. Um, I, it's a lot of extra time, a lot of extra effort, a lot of extra work, and from our side, it's even, uh, well, I'll speak personally, sometimes it's even a little more frustrating for me because I know we're looking at it from our perspective, and, and I realize there has to be some compromise, and I realize, and we said this from the very beginning, we can have the dialogue, but we're going to agree on the results. And, and having said that, um, I, I can respect where you guys are coming from, but I, I just got to get this off my chest. We've got really $335,000 of additional investments in a $39 million budget. And to assume that, to maintain the status quo, assumes we're already at a level that's acceptable. And while I don't believe that we can, or nor should we, as, as Kelly had said, jump to the Yarmouth, Cumberland, Falmouth level in a year, that's what's got us in trouble in the past. High investments, low, low cuts, high, and that, that seesaw. It's really 
challenging for me to look at that 335 and say, we've really done everything that we think we possibly can to address the concerns, to get our base budget in line with what we really feel is the bare essentials, and we really just want this extra money to make those improvements moving forward. It's less than 1%. And with the recommendation that came out of finance, I understand it, and I, I, I get it. We've been very involved in those conversations. That's a 26, almost 27% reduction in those in possible improvements. And, and if you include the, the special services that we all agree kind of need to be there, we don't have a whole lot of choice in that, that's an even further reduction. So. I, I, I very much respect the level services approach. It's something that we drive to, to, uh, to, to maintain, but that, is, that takes into account a very base assumption that our level service now is adequate and appropriate and acceptable. And I, and I hope moving forward that we've, we've helped convey and helped communicate the fact that we're not really at that point yet where we can level off. That's our goal, that's where we want to be. I appreciate the compromise here with the reduction. I understand that that has to happen at some level. But I really want us to move forward with the understanding that we're not really at that base yet. We need further investments and further incremental steps just to get to that level where we could say it's sustainable now. Now we can do the, the, the minor increases that um, found with the Armith Cumberland and all those people are doing now. Um, and I just wanted to make one point, Peter. Um, I agree with you 100%, and it's from this side of the table, it's easy to say, we do need to let the people decide, and we are making assumptions for them, because even the reductions that you mm -hmm. propose, those are decisions that are made in these groups, mm -hmm. and, and within our parameters to do that, before the people even get to decide that. So I think that's another discussion point to, to talk about, is how do we balance that with our fiduciary responsibility to manage the expectations that we have for a town, but also take into account the very real and unique situation of the school budget does go to vote. And how do we manage that appropriately to make sure that what goes out there is A, representative of what we need from a school perspective, but also B, representative of the financial accountability and responsibility that we have. And I think, uh, look, moving forward, I. I it's not the way I'd like it to be this year. That's the definition of compromise, right? Nobody gets what they want. Right. But I, I do think the work has been very, very positive. I think it's been certainly encouraging that we're going to, and I hope we continue it regardless of who's sitting in the seats. That was kind of where we started, started off with this, should, this process should outlive our, us as individuals. Mm -hmm. It should be fundamental changes as to how the town does business. So I'll get off my soapbox now. Sure. I know, sorry. These guys are those long diatribes. These guys are, they've already taken their nap. Uh, so they're, you know, just yeah. good. Uh, um, I did want to mention, because it wasn't included as an attachment, but there is a, um, a list available, and we'll forward that updated based upon the committee, that gives a line um, transaction on where the adjustments are uh, based upon uh, the administrations for both the school and the town, as well as our adjustments. So I'll make sure we can get it done in time, um, as you noticed on the time on the other sheet, but I will make sure everyone gets a copy of that. Thank you. In fact, looking forward to next Wednesday, which is second reading, we will have prepared, and I would respectfully suggest that perhaps the first motion offered is the Finance Committee's set of recommendations, yeah. which they divide out certain ones or not. But we'll have them prepared so that can be considered first, and then of course you can go beyond that as you wish. Just one last point. I mean, this. Joint Finance Committee thing has been incredible as far as interboard relations, but just community wide, I think people understand issues a lot more than they have in the past because, you know, this isn't the first time we've had a major whack taken out of our budget by the state. But, I mean, it is one town budget, so there's a lot less like, oh man, schools, what are you going to do? That stinks for you. But, you know, like, we all understand that this is one town, one budget. So if the school gets a big chunk taken out, the town is the revenue generating side. So, I mean, it's. I think this is exactly what we're hoping would, would happen, is that by working together, there are no surprises. There is no, like, sitting back arms folded and saying, deal with it. It's your problem, not ours. Because everyone in this room at this table is a taxpayer. Everyone who's 
kid goes to school is a taxpayer. So I don't. It's not our job to wait which taxpayer is more important than another. So regardless of age or how long somebody's lived in town, and I think this working together is only going to be a benefit and improve going forward. So thank you everyone for making that happen. All right. So we have um, the last item which will be coming, um, unless you had something else to add, Tom, for the no. next steps, okay, no. um, is public comment. So, uh, March to Sanctus, um, I just had one question. I've done, I'm, I'm, my whole career was in finance. Done millions of multi-million dollar budgets. And one thing I always looked at when I was looking at budgets was actual, actual expenditures annualized. So, you know, like, if we've done 10 months out of a 12-month budget, what is 10 months annualized? So where are we? And compare that to budget. And all your are budgets compared to budgets compared to budgets. So my question is, have you at any point looked at actual spending and annualized that to see where you are on that 15 budget, that 2015 budget? You get a yeah. Well, I mean, we, we well, have we school have budget combined. Huh? Is that like for just school or total combined municipal or both? Yeah, both. I believe I, I, what I just heard. It, the schools is on the school website and it's available yeah. every month. We just received our financial statements for the town. Quarterly, sorry. Yeah, but it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't annualize anything. We haven't annualized the fiscal fifteen. You have? We have not. No, That's something that we generally do at this time of year and. Um, after about 10 minutes outside of one of these meetings, uh, that will be well. It's, it's just, but it's, it's beneficial to see an actual annualized so that you can see what line items you've, where you're underspending or overspending, yeah. and make those adjustments. We, we do, when we do our quarterlies, we look at we look at where we're at in relative to the, the budget year. So if we've got let's say a uh, hundred thousand dollars allocated for for, for textbooks for the year. So, so we'll look at first quarter and say we're 23 percent expenditure for that line, and then we can so we can look at it and get a general idea from quarter to quarter whether we're on projection, off projection, whether things are coming in. Let's say we have a bad year in fuel costs, our contract we got hit for something or whatever. We'll see that and recognize that because at the end of the year we do have to do reconciliations to line everything up. Okay. So, so we because all, cause all we see on here is 15's budget, right? And then 16's budget, right. and then it doesn't tell us. 15 is actual anywhere, so that's kind of where I was going. I think that's a very helpful statement, and there there is that material out there. There's certainly material for fiscal 14, which is completed, and 13, so that you can see trends. And uh, what we'll try and do is is post something that has some of that prior year data in it on the school side. And, that out and on the town side, we do pro provide information to our finance committee, and that's currently out on the town's website under finance. And it it's it's really high level. It just shows you know major. Here's what and we budgeted. Actual, here's what we spent. Analyzed. It's here's what we spent through through April. So it's it's ten months, which is like eighty something percent spent. And we do the same thing. We say okay. We're 90% spent, so there's some issue here. We have to make some adjustments elsewhere to cover that. Um, also, in the 2016 budget, we are looking to purchase some software that will help with providing some more information to the citizens on our website that we can just, you know, kind of like download into our soft uh, onto the website from our software, our financial software, and folks can kind of take a look at it, you know, run scenarios, if you will. And, and, Thank you very much. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, just lastly, our budget presentation includes uh, two actual prior years, and we do a projection for the current year. And your year. finance committee. That's actually the budget. It's not a budget. It should be online. Let's see. Oh, wow. It's there. If not, I don't know. Let me find it. That's on the town manager's website. Oh, it's, I have to go to the town manager to find it? No, town manager's website. I mean, it's it, it's on the town's website under manager. Oh, okay. I don't know that I looked under town manager. Any other questions? <laughs> uh, I have a question and some remarks. On the reduction from the original proposal, um, I've attended many of these meetings, and I'm not, I can't answer the question in my own mind. 
who's made the cuts. I, it seems to me it's been the school committee that's brought the cuts forward, the changes in, in revenue and, um, and expenses. The changes that we reflected on this evening in the packet were all brought forward by the school board to the council. The changes that were made this afternoon in the town council finance committee meeting are controlled by the town. Right, and, and what what's the dollars of our decrease? I'm, I'm not sure, Sean, what, what the finance committee is. What portion they, they have decreased this original budget? Uh, it seems like most of it has been from the school. I borrowed from my local taxi base. This is the school's piece that was yeah. already completed, and then I think. Uh, so the change on um, the school board and superintendent's recommendation for their item adjustments uh, was a decrease of $1.4 million. The town council uh, finance committee met today and um, the items that I mentioned before when I went through the tax uh, impact were the items that we adjusted, which was the $90,000 in gross educational expenditures and the $225,000 in revenue. Uh, which was the transfer of the uh, funds of the cash reserve amount, and then the decrease of seventy-five thousand dollars to the capital improvement project. It got, it got a little confusing. No, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, it definitely got confusing. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely did. So I like to say that I, I support the one-on-one -on -one computer. I certainly have a good investment in the qualifications, qualifications on their qualifications. I mean, after I was at the school board and finance committee, and the folks had studied this a few years, they stand up and there's $500. It's, you know, if we're in the business world, a decision would have been made within six months. And we're not in that world, I can assure you. Uh, yeah, six yeah. months is in that world. And I think, I think George and Kate and Chris, your finance uh, committee has done a great job in developing a budget and the communication that we have. Specifically, uh, Kate is helping out a couple times here to get to see how this uh, process works in the public sector. So I appreciate that. Uh, I've served on a school board, its finance committee, negotiations, and budget, budget committee. Um, if I was a member of the school board, I would be supporting this, this budget because that would be my duty and responsibility. Um, I, I have no particular beef with the school department. My wife worked in the public schools for 20 years, so I have some idea of the challenges that teachers and administrators have, and, and also the, the tug of war every year with, with the state on how many dollars we're going to get. And we're, we're trying to set a budget, and we never know until after the fact what we're going to get from that. Um, on the town council side, two of the goals for 2015 were to recognize financial constraints and two, stability in the tax rate. At this time, these goals have been met on the municipal 2016 budget with, with the proposed recommendations to the council of less than 2% interest. And you guys took, took each of those department heads and, and took their budgets apart. And I think that's been consistent with what you've done in past years of having like a 3% increase. Uh, the school proposed budget at this point seems to be around 8%. Um, like in the past, the council has done a good job of, of the other departments. I don't think the same can be said on the school side. My focus is on the affordability and the size of the annual increase, and not only the net local contribution, but the gross budget. Like many of you, I'm self-employed and have the direct correlation, not the direct correlation between total expenses and what is left over for my family. Like you, the higher expenses, the less money left for the family. According to the school department, over the last five years, from 2010 to 2015, the budget has grown by 20.2%. And now we're looking at 8% this year. So my question uh, to the town council who set these goals, these financial goals, is who in our community or who at the table here has seen a 20% increase in their income in the last five years and 8 or 9% this year? That's where the dollars come from. So I have no argument with, you know, if I'm sitting on the school board, I'm going to be making, you know, I'm going to support everything that's been said today. So if I'm on the town council, I have a different, a different response to that. Okay. Um, is there any other questions? None. All right. So um, I didn't 
get a 22% raise. I'll be the first one to say that. We've been pretty flat at my house. Um, <laughs> Up yeah, I don't know. We can grow more peas or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, so um, that's it for after we'll public comment. The last item is adjourned. So thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Hopefully it was helpful. Thanks. So I have one paper. This is the website. So I noticed there's no one. Click on the website.